Hi, it's Dr. Lee Rogers. I'm here at the Association of Podiatry in Romania, and we are starting this Facebook Live session with Professor David Armstrong from USC's Keck School of Medicine, uh, talking about the future of the diabetic foot. So everybody here in Romania and uh, around the world, please uh, help me welcome Professor Armstrong. <laughs> it's really good to see you, Dr. Rogers. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing great. Great. Yeah. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I think uh, now good morning to you all in North America uh, and uh, early morning in Asia. That's true. Yeah, very early, uh, uh, late at night. But let's, uh, let's get rolling. Looks like a lot of people have already uh, uh, logged in. And let's make this happen. You ready? Ready to go. All right. Oh, you guys. Uh, it's great to be back, and may I also say to everyone um, watching from around the world, this has been a spectacular uh, meeting. You guys are really missing out. Next time, uh, come to Sanaya or wherever the meeting is next year, uh, Timoswara, wherever it is, uh, because uh, this uh, symposium uh, in Romania, uh, thanks to our uh, lovely uh, chairwoman and chairman, uh, John Van, uh, Norina Van. This is a, a spectacular event, and I think we owe them a real round of applause. This has been a packed house with just great programming. So. All right, so let's do this. So what we'll talk about now um, is uh, a, a little bit of review for all of us in the room, um, because of course we have been speaking uh, not only about tissue repair, wound healing, surgical reconstruction, remission, uh, and everything. Uh, but for the people watching uh, at home, um, in their underwear, in their pajamas, or in their offices around the world, this will be a little bit of a uh, background. Then after that, what we're going to do is we're going to be talking about technologies uh, that our group at Salsa have been working on at USC, some of our friends um, at other units uh, around the world have been working on and really appear into the future. It's, it, and I, what I'll tell you guys is the future is now, and it's a super exciting time uh, to be working in this space. Uh, and, and what we're going to talk about is methods uh, through new technologies to maximize the ulcer-free, hospital-free, and activity-rich uh, uh, days. We remember uh, the discussion uh, earlier today uh, of talking not only about wound healing, uh, but recurrence. Uh, you'll recall that uh, very recently we had a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine that sort of summarized uh, much of this. Um, and in that, uh, in that summary, we discussed really what causes uh, these diabetic foot ulcers uh, to occur. And you're all very well aware of this, especially after the NeuroDiab uh, meeting yesterday uh, with uh, Ava Feldman and Radhika uh, Papasui. Uh, and uh, everyone yesterday, that cavalcade of brilliance. But let's just go through this briefly. And, and what we know and what we can see is that in the face of, of diabetes and neuropathy, there's really three basic kinds of neuropathy. We see motor neuropathy, which may cause uh, some uh, uh, in, in, uh, foot deformity, intrinsic muscle wasting. Muscle wasting can cause biomechanical uh, abnormalities. Sensory uh, neuropathy causes the loss of the gift of pain, as you heard us discuss, and then finally, automatic neuropathy can create decreased uh, sweating, it can also cause uh, dry skin, and the overall quality of the tissue, because of cross-linking, turns the tissue from being, uh, it's a little bit more like a cracker, and a little less like a tortilla. You know, what's the, what's the Romanian uh, translation for tortilla? 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 That's easy. Maybe it's been around here longer than it has uh, where, where we're from. But there we are. That leads to callus formation. You saw all of them, and ultimately, uh, uh, ultimately subcutaneous uh, hemorrhage with repetitive trauma and peripheral artery disease just makes everything a little more complicated. So that's what we see. And ultimately, this ulcer, both occurrence and recurrence. So we talked about the fact that maybe we can't really heal anyone. Maybe once people heal, uh, maybe they're not healed because of the dramatic rate of recurrence in these patients, 40% at one year, 66% uh, at uh, three. Uh, maybe 
Uh, they're not healed, maybe like with cancer, patients are in remission. So our goal then um, will be to mitigate the complexity of these problems. And we can do that through good old fashioned uh, uh, hard work, like we talked about, um, surgical, non-surgical, medical, mechanical, and we can also do it through some technology and gadgetry. Um, and that's really the discussion. So if we're talking then about how we can prevent uh, severe recurrence in this population, if we believe that it's very difficult, or if not impossible, to prevent all recurrence, then how can we prevent those really severe wounds from showing up? Maybe then we can marry some technology with a little common sense. Uh, again, a bit of a review. Uh, we talked about the fact that in the face of neuropathy, we have high pressure, time cycles of activity, which leads to, oh, this is great, which leads to these, these wounds that, uh, that we see every day. Although I don't see so many of these little wounds every day anymore, I would love to see uh, little wounds like this um, uh, every day. But these things really are just an imbalance. Uh, they're an imbalance in the face of neuropathy of pressure and activity. And if we can bring that imbalance into balance, then I think we're going to win. Um, and many years ago, this is one of my oldest slides. You can see it's almost uh, sepia tone. Um, but uh, it, I think I wrote this in the 90s, in the 80s. Um, seriously, uh, no one here was around in the 80s, were they? Uh, but uh, well, what I thought back then was maybe we could take activity, um, and maybe activity is a little like a drug. Um, with a drug too high, you get toxicity, too low, and you don't get the drug's benefit. Same thing with activity. Too high in a person with neuropathy and diabetes, and they're going to wear a hole in their foot and get an ulcer, too low, and they won't get the, the cardiovascular, the insulin sensitizing, or the feel-good benefits of activity. But maybe we can work to coax people into slightly better activity. And, and how do we do that? The only way to do that, we can't do that if we can't measure it. But now, of course, we can measure this. Uh, you, we, you all have that solution uh, in your pocket, or if you're watching on Facebook, you're watching it on a little screen that's attached to a, a little computer that has an accelerometer in it or a gyroscope. And, and uh, so this is a, a slide from uh, uh, when we were uh, in Chicago and Boston. And, uh, this is a postdoc from our postdocs running around uh, with his activity monitor on him. And I, I don't uh, uh, know that you can see all of this, but even uh, uh, back then with a, with a um, net mounted device, something that just be worn like a pendant, um, we see that we can see not only when someone is walking, when they're standing, sitting, prone, supine, crawling, begging for mercy, and uh, all of these things, just like postdocs are supposed to do. But what you can see here um, is that if you look at this activity, just second to second, minute to minute, day to day, what does it look a little bit like? It looks like either an action potential or it kind of looks like an, an ECG, doesn't it? Um, and these patients' activities now are like an ECG for our life. And what we're starting to see is we're starting to see pulses of activity that predate an ulcer. So if we see, just like with an ECG that you saw irregularly, irregular heartbeat, that might predate uh, a, a cardiac event. Um, if the same, the same thing we see, and we published this 10 years ago now, 15 years ago, is we see if we see irregularly irregular activity or just a broad um, range of activity um, in a patient, what we tend to see is an ulcer coming shortly thereafter. And we can start seeing this with this very simple tool, which I believe will be transformative uh, in the, uh, the coming years. It already is starting to do that um, in our clinic uh, at Salsa where we can review this with many of our patients if they're so inclined. But I see this becoming part of a, of a chart. We did talk already uh, in our time together, uh, not that long, but in our time together about diabetic foot surgery. I'm only going to gloss through this since we went through it in so much depth. Uh, we'll do this uh, uh, maybe another time we can get into this. Uh, but, uh, suffice it to say that we, if we cannot uh, treat someone externally by pressure relief with casting, shoes, insoles, various gantry, then maybe we can do it internally uh, through surgery or physiotherapy, as you might say, in the UK. Anyone watching from the UK? Okay. Um, so, 
let's move on and let's kind of honor our mentors. I think uh, we were talking about today that this meeting is, uh, has become a kind of an on, uh, a, a meeting where we can honor our mentors, and, and these are two of mine. Um, uh, one of them is uh, Professor Andrew Bolton, who's here at left. He's not here right now, thank goodness, so we can talk about it. And he's definitely not watching Facebook. He himself is a Luddite. Uh, he uh, just learned uh, email recently. I'm kidding, he's been using email for some time. Uh, but I think he's sworn off social media. Uh, not that he's anti-social, just that he has sworn off social media. But if he is sort of the crown prince of the diabetic foot, then this would be the king of the foot there, and that's the king of the incentive. That's Professor Paul Brand, uh, back in the day, and this is me, I carry their bags for them. I don't carry his, I don't carry his bags anymore. He passed away about 15 years ago. But uh, Bolton? High maintenance, the travel's heavy. Uh, but Professor Brand, Paul Wilson Brand, way back in the day, uh, said this. He said a lot of things, but one uh, that might stick to uh, uh, here is that if we look at these wounds that are in remission, as we uh, coin the term, they will heat up before they break down. So if you're talking about any kind of chronic disease and you want to sound smart, uh, right afterwards at the cocktail hour, and by the way, who doesn't want to sound smart? Uh, then all you have to do is take a sip of your drink um, and then and just say, oh, inflammation, and walk away, <laughs> and you will be correct. Uh, it doesn't matter what you're talking about, because uncontrolled inflammation in the face of uh, any chronic disease is the bane of our existence. And so we can measure that. Well, we need to. We can do that in the diabetic foot, and let's talk about that. Let's talk about things that are available now and things that will be soon available. You've seen a little bit of this. This is uh, from, our, um, from our team more than uh, a decade ago. I can't believe the study was a decade ago where we saw that wounds indeed will heat up uh, before they break down. This showed a week in advance. Uh, a study we did in 1997 showed up to several weeks in advance we can see a hot spot on one foot compared to the other foot. Just two degrees Celsius, 2.2 .2 degrees Celsius or more, was a trigger, something that was, we thought, statistically uh, uh, interesting enough to uh, take action. Um, but what has happened now is that entire companies have started, that have been developing this. And I'll show you an example. Um, a group, a uh, little startup that came from uh, MIT's Sloan Business School and Harvard's Business School, uh, it came together and uh, consulted with us at Salsa. Um, and they came up with a, a device that far exceeded anything that we did. You saw it a little bit discussed today by uh, good Dr. Rogers. And uh, yes, here it is. So this is nothing more than a bath mat um, that, uh, is, uh, that will measure skin temperature on the bottom of the foot. And it can identify things, several hundred spots on the bottom of the foot, and compare spots and trend them. And it looks for asymmetries. And this technology by itself um, has uh, just uh, been validated in the study uh, led by uh, Freiburg and by Jean Najafi uh, and, uh, and others, and the data were really, really compelling. If we could just identify a problem hours in advance, that would be great. We'd be able to stop a lot of wounds. What this study suggested was that they could identify these wounds weeks in advance, several weeks. So this if anything, ladies and gentlemen, is a game changer, this idea, and maybe it's not this device, maybe it's future devices, but this kind of idea looking for uh, a signature, uh, either in activity or in skin temperature, is a game changer. Uh, then, when you can hook this thing up with other things, like, um, like perhaps uh, telling our patient where, where this can phone the patient and say, Ms. Garcia, your big toe is hotter than your other big toe, and you know what? You've taken 30% more activity between 10.30 and noon than you usually take in a whole day. What's going on, Ms. Garcia? Uh, you know, and, hey, why don't you do this, Ms. Garcia? Why don't you reach into the closet and grab that boot that we had, that, uh, we had made for you? We can see it's there because of the RFID tag in it. Uh, and uh, you know, we're gonna make you an appointment to see Dr. Bowling on Friday, because it looks like he's not very busy. Can you believe that? Front bowling not being busy. Um, neither can I. But, uh, but let's, uh, let's get into one of those moments because we have access to his electronic medical record. And uh, we're going to forward all this.
consideration, okay? Okay. Uh, uh, and so this kind of thing, either through an actual call center or through a bot, you know, that we might see, instead of, uh, you know, like a Russian election bot, this would be like a, a bot that could actually communicate with a patient uh, and, and actually carry on this conversation and help people. Uh, and I think this could be really exciting. So enough of that. What about intelligent textiles? So we have been working with smart textiles for years now, 10, 15 years. Um, and uh, they've been weaved into all kinds of things from smart shirts to uh, smart socks, uh, smart uh, insoles, no kidding, even smart underwear. Um, but uh, that's a whole different thing, but we don't have time to discuss it. But uh, these smart socks um, have been uh, really pioneered uh, by uh, uh, Dovenor and, and Bijan and Jaffe and, uh, uh, and our team, and we can identify pressure, temperature, and even uh, joint angles. So we can use it, use it almost like a goniometer. We can see when arthritis is about to develop, in addition to when a wound is about to develop. The trouble with these devices, th th this technology, is like with a lot of things, it's great for the lab, but it's not very practical in real life. So what to do? What should we do? Um, well. We didn't do anything, but a uh, very, uh, a really clever uh, young lady who's a biomedical engineer came to one of our meetings, our DEF CON meeting, I think back in 2015. Isn't that right, Grandma? Uh, and her name is Ran Ma, what a great name. Um, and not Grandma, but Ran Ma. Uh, and Ran uh, said to us, you know, we like what you're doing with thermometry and everything, but we think we can do better. Uh, we want to make some smart socks. And we said, go for it. And I was talking to them about maybe subscribing to the socks, because I thought, wouldn't it be cool if you could subscribe to one of these things? Just like, you, I, I know it sounds crazy, but just like you subscribe to your Hulu, or your Netflix, or, 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 your, or your, you know, your cell phone, or whatever, you could subscribe to some gadgetry. And God bless them, they did it. And they started this little company. Do I have it? Yeah, check this out. And you subscribe to these socks, um, and you get like uh, six or seven pairs, one for each day of the week, um, and, uh, and, and then a little thing that just plugs into the wall that just uh, gives you a radio. There's nothing for the patient to do or you to do. All it does is it measures your skin temperature across your foot and attaches to a graphic user interface on the phone and gives you a remarkable amount of very rich data on skin temperature. This appears to be similarly interesting, just like the, 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 the bath method you saw from that uh, uh, Harvard and MIT group of podometrics. So these technologies are fascinating and they are happening right now. Uh, and, and I think we're going to see technologies like this that blur the line between medical devices and, and consumer devices uh, start to become more and more common for us uh, as physicians, surgeons, clinicians. Opa, can you hear that? Okay. Uh, and, uh, we're just breaking plates. It is a crazy party here, up here in the region. <laughs> but look at this. So let me just show you. So they make this device, and then they enter into the uh, consumer electronic show, where they it is the, the biggest uh, convention of any kind in the world. 150,000 people. It's in Las Vegas every year. In 2017, and they're competing against virtual reality, this and augmented. Reality that. So reality, reality ends up winning the TechCrunch hardware battlefield. It was unbelievable. Socks ended up winning this thing. Uh, and so it's an exciting time for all of us to be doing what we're doing. And this is only going to get more exciting. Uh, and there's, there's uh, Dave and there's Ram. These guys are just freaking great. Look at that. Giant check. I don't mean check like Czech Republic, I mean like a check for money. But uh, fascinating. But let's continue. Here's another really cool gadget. Uh, if it uh, if it ever works, I don't know that it will. But the bottom line is this is a, a device now developed by uh, Brianne uh, Brianne Everett. She developed a company called Orpix, which took uh, some of the ideas that uh, we had discussed in the '90s and Paul Brand had discussed in the '70s called sensory substitution. So imagine now you could take an insole. Um, and then that insole could just measure pressure, not peak pressure, but pressure over a short period of time. And then that pressure could then be transmitted uh, to uh, either a smart garment, uh, like, a, like a shirt and buzz up on the, 
you know, like a map on the back on your back, uh, up on your neck. If it was your uh, big toe down here and the small of your back, if it was your heel. Well, that was the first iteration of this device. Subsequent uh, versions of this device were just as cool and went on to early versions of a smartwatch. Now, this thing is available uh, and it can just identify the hot areas of high pressure um, and then can alert the patient to maybe modify slightly the way they walk and it will give them an alert. This kind of thing is for real. Um, but then, what if we go from this to something even cooler that could take all the stuff we talked about and then autonomously adjust? And that's uh, what's next. Uh, this is really awesome work from friends of ours, uh, uh, Zoltan Pataki and uh, EPFL in, uh, in Geneva. Uh, and check this out. So this is, uh, they already made a prototype of this device. This thing has these little baby shock absorbers in it, and it could identify high pressure and then adjust. The really cool thing would be if you could identify that spot and then autonomously adjust. And this is what is being worked on now there, and also our group uh, are working on this uh, with another uh, a, a team uh, uh, to try to make uh, with shape memory alloys, what we call the recovery force, uh, where we're trying to develop shape memory alloys that could actually deform in real time. This is just really cool. But we'll see. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, it's in the works. But let's, you know, the next step would of course be naturally wearable robots. Uh, so uh, let's get into this. You guys may have seen some cool versions of uh, wearable technology like these wearable robots uh, in the past uh, that can assist patients with spinal cord injuries in moving both upper extremity and lower extremity wearable robots. We have been, our group have been fascinated with these things for the longest time. I envisage many of our patients waking up in the morning um, and instead of getting into a walker and walking around, maybe getting into a wearable robot that might actually allow them to get around the house a little easier, maybe help them with their balance, maybe give them little games they can play or exercises and measure their activity. As long as uh, the battery power uh, is, continues to improve, this is going to continue to improve. Uh, and there are various iterations of, of lower extremity devices that are less complex than some of these other full body devices. And maybe the killer device here might be this uh, wearable device where we can uh, measure pressure, temperature, gait variability, uh, give uh, posture alerts, and have some shape memory features and gamification features where we can allow people to uh, in place do little exercises to improve their balance. We know that if we give patients with postural instability exercises to do, just very simple ones for the lower extremity, that can have transient benefits in improving balance and then potentially reducing fall risk and we believe also potentially reducing ulcer, diabetic foot ulcer risk. So more on that later, but it's pretty fun now to be doing this. There's an entire now wearable robot association uh, led by uh, Tom Sugar and Joe Hitt, friends of ours. Uh, this is a really interesting thing. I think <coughs> this is going to be much more interesting in the years to come. Uh, and then let's try to conclude with a couple of really cool things. Wearables, they're great but they're getting a little boring. Uh, we've been working with wearables for the last, well, 20 something years. Maybe though, we can take wearables and marry them with injectables. Now this is freaking cool. So watch this. So imagine if you could take a little something and inject it under the skin and then ping it uh, with a laser. You know, because laser, lasers, uh, it, uh, it's just cool enough. Well, this is really a thing. Uh, a group called Propusa um, have developed a very small device which is only 200 by 500 microns. It looks like a little vitamin E tablet. You can inject it under the skin and then you can hit it um, with, with a laser. Um, and let me just show you, you can put it right under the skin and then when you hit it, it well, it's just histologically really quiet. This is from a grant of ours from a, a couple of years ago. Um, you can see it doesn't call a lot of attention to itself. Um, but when you hit it with a laser, you can read oxygenation in real time. There are other things that it could read as well. You could probably imagine some of the things that could be read. 
with a device like this, think about lactate, think about blood sugar, and other things that potentially could happen with these sort of sensors. And I believe that very soon, things like this are going to be in our body and in our patients' bodies, and many people are going to be modding their bodies, just like they get a, I know this sounds crazy, but just like they get a tattoo now, I think people will mod their bodies with sensors and things that can give them extra features um, and extra ways to measure this. And, uh, stay tuned, um, because I think that's in the works. And we're gonna have to figure out how to, met, how to get all this to communicate with itself, kind of a biologic Wi-Fi, but that's what's next. This is uh, work uh, from Profusa and from Miguel uh, Montero Baker, one of our old residents who's now uh, a, a big time vascular surgeon in Houston. And you can see this device really works. You can see during an angioplasty at the SFA how you can see a collinear increase in tissue oxygenation during that balloon angioplasty. Um, but let's finish with this thing. So, You've heard a little bit about vascular disease and vascular surgery. We talked about how when someone heals a wound, they're not really healed, they're in remission for a wound. So too with vascular surgery. When someone has had a vascular repair, be it an open procedure or an endo procedure, they're in vascular remission, the clock is ticking. But wouldn't it be cool if we could identify the problem before it ever became an acute on a chronic one? So now this, ladies and gentlemen, is a thing. This is a PTFE, it's a cortex graft for in the short segment uh, 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 open repair, uh, excuse me, short segment uh, open bypass, and it has in it a little device that measures hemodynamics, not tissue confusion, but hemodynamics, and it can tell now, you pair with it in the operating room on the back table, and then using Bluetooth, and then it can tell you when the, there's a significant stenosis graft acceleration, and things about to go down. So instead of a person coming into clinic uh, um, every six months, they can do this at home with a home-based monitor. This uh, now has undergone some of the uh, first in animal tests. Uh, that was, this is by a company called Graphworks. Uh, it was uh, also done um, uh, some of the first uh, in human tests. So this is a very, very exciting time to be seeing these kinds of devices. I think some of these smart conduits are going to exist um, as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, I will, uh, conclude uh, just with this. You know, we hear, uh, we see all of these sorts of technologies, things from robotics and uh, an energy and battery supply and really cool wearables and uh, next gen cellular tech and mobile tech, all accelerating um, and, and growing at an exponential rate, and they're all kind of moving away from us, a little bit like entropy uh, in the universe. Uh, and the only way to, f to, to fight entropy in any system is to put a little energy into that system to try to bring all these things together and to make it into something that makes sense and can make a difference. Uh, and I think that if we come together in what we're talking about, which is in the diabetic foot and in podiatry, or just in a greater sense, it doesn't stop with any of these specialties, and it's super interdisciplinary. I think we can really make a difference. I think we can make a difference in healing these patients. I think we can make a difference in maximizing ulcer-free days, uh, hospital-free days, activity-rich days, um, and I think we can improve uh, not just the quantity of life, uh, but the quality of life, because I ultimately think that's what we all deserve, whether we have diabetes or not, no matter what our health, and uh, no matter what our age, ladies and gentlemen, People at home, thank you very much.